Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to the Strawberry Baron stream. Um, coming to you live from YouTube, Rockfin and Rumble today. We finally have it all working. Um, so everyone knows, back with a bang this week, we had uh, Rachel Wilson earlier, but today we have John Waters, where we're going to talk about his, uh, hopefully, his upcoming election for in the European elections 2024. Um, so what I've done this week is I put up a community post yesterday or the day before where I asked you guys what you would like to ask John and I have collated a list of about 12 questions now we'll see if we have time for them all um but we'll try and get through as many of them as I can um I won't I I have highlighted one thing that somebody asked in the comment section already I won't be able to look through the comment section while I'm reading I have the questions here on the side for John if you want to support the stream, if you want to ask John a question that I don't already have on the list, you can see on the top of whoop, here, you can tip me, buy me a whiskey uh, at this, and I'll read those questions out at the end if there are any. Um, all right, John, how are you? I'm okay, Shane. Thank you. Thank you. All right. How do you like your thumbnail? Oh, it's really, okay. it's extraordinary. Yeah. Where did you get that? Who did, is, is, it's beautiful, actually. I mean, I mean, I'm not beautiful, but uh, the picture of me is beautiful. If you can, if that can happen, I don't know. Uh, but it is. It's very, very striking graphic. I think you know, so I like it. Yeah, a friend of mine. Um, he made a load of them uh, options for me to put up. And what I found funny was somebody just before the stream said he thought you had a look in that picture. He thought you had a look of uh, um, Sean Connery. And I had thought oh, the same about a different one, not about that one. I actually, this one here was another one that was made from a picture of you, and uh, in this one, it really does look like it's Sean Connery oh, it to me. That is Sean Connery, actually. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but you know, that's all right. Uh, yeah, uh, I've been I've been compared to worse. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um. So I have these twelve questions for you now. There's a that they range in size and in scale uh one of them is really like a number of questions in a question and some of them are very easy and short and you know simple to answer so i'll start from the start um in no particular order question number one was why did we not get protection from the eu seeing that we are a small number and an indigenous group what does john think oh well i mean that's kind of the opposite of what the EU is, you know, it, it's not about protecting anybody. It's not about, um, except the rich and powerful. It's not about, uh, you know, the things it claims to be about, you know, European values and democratic values and all that stuff and forget about that. You know, it's, it's basically a, a nascent uh, totalitarian state. That's what it is. You can see all the signs now very clearly, but in fact, they were very, they were obvious kind of from the, from the early stages. Uh, you know, this salami tactic where they sort of rolled the, the thing out slice by slice, you know, a common market, European community, European Union, you know, then we're going to federal state, but then you're going to basically centrally controlled, uh, essentially uh, quasi communist, but actually a different, a new kind of capitalism, really. Uh, and uh, that's kind of what it is. So you don't expect anything from it. Anybody. You know, when you look at the way they, they behave and the way they behave during the Ukraine war or at the early stages of it, I mean, uh, you know, the way that they imposed without any consultation with their, you know, voters or whatever. I mean, you know, they, this is, you know, I'm, I'm going to European elections uh, to go to the European Parliament, you know, and, you know, obviously I, hope, I would like to get in there and, and begin to say things. But I mean, you're going to be talking to people who never got a vote in their lives. I mean, the, the people over the people who control the European Union don't bother with votes, you know, they just do whatever they want to do. And in a certain sense, the Parliament is there as a gracing aspect on that undemocratic process. Uh, but I hope to maybe throw a grenade into the middle of that once or twice uh, in my time there. Yeah. So so I don't have any expectations. I'm not, you know, I'm not surprised by anything that happens out of the EU. It's, you know, my father, like, was dead against the, the European Union when I was a, just a, a young fella, you know. He was completely set against it, like, and and uh, a lot of those guys were, you know, the older guys, you know, who had listened, who had studied Ireland and followed everything and were aware of all the nuances of Irish history and all that constitution all this stuff they really knew this was real big trouble you know but they were outvoted like spectacularly really you know i can't remember it was way up in the late 70s not the 80s uh, the vote in that case that into referendum so 
It's pretty, it's pretty hard to reverse. But anyway, that's what mm. that's where we're going. The other thing is, of course, that I, I suspect that the European Union will be kaput within a year or two at the most. So, you know, I don't know what I'm going to do for a job then. <laughs> um, you've halfway answered the second question, which is, um, what are your thoughts on EU membership in general? Do you see a place for an iRexit? I'm thinking uh, I'm thinking of Nigel Farage in his position as a member of the EU Parliament, as a voice against the EU. Yeah. And he wonders, well, is, that, is that what your plan yeah. is? Yeah, well, I, I actually spoke with Nigel on a platform in Dublin uh, about six years ago, and that was the title, I rigs it. You know, and uh, um, in principle, I believe, I think that, you know, an independent Ireland is the only way forward, but that needs to be an independent Ireland by its own lights, not one which has been altered out of all recognition by these globalist forces. So we've got a lot of reversing to do before we get that point. But the difficulty is with this kind of thing that that we're so un- deeply embedded now and so dependent and that Europe is that European Union is such a, a, a you know, it's a set of in, 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 interdependencies and that we need to reverse all that. You see the trouble that the, the British are having, like just disengaging, you know, and, and like it's obviously clearly being being frustrated by the the, by the European countries and so on. So mm-hmm. it's a big project, but I, I would hope that actually it will decide itself that the whole thing, once the euro collapses, which it will very shortly, then the whole thing will follow and we will be sort of uh, cast back on ourselves. And that will be a good thing because then we can go back to seeking sovereignty under all the headings, the relevant headings, you know, mm. money, banking, food, fuel, etc., etc., which they're grotesquely interfering with. Like, I mean, the fishing thing is really, I've been talking about it recently. I've did a video about it, which should be going up soon. You know, it's absolutely bonkers that our fishing, we're in our own waters, like we're ta- we're actually permitted to catch essentially single figure, percentage figures of fishes, fish in those waters. Different categories of fish have different percentages, but they're all pretty low in our case. Whereas France and Belgium and other countries like that can come in and take 60, 70 percent of the fish in our waters. People have no idea what's been done to Ireland, you know, and they talk mm. about, you know, they threw us a few bob to build roads, which are actually there for the advantage of the, the market. They're not there for the advantage mm. of the people. And uh, so, yeah, I, 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 I would I would hope that in my lifetime I will see the end of the European Union and um that we will disengage from it and we'll go back to being good old ireland and find a cadre of leaders who have the capacity and the imagination to run ireland by its own lights and reverse all of this globalism and all of this foreign direct investment all this corporatism all this fascism and and restore the ireland that i was born into quite a few years ago back in the in the mid 50s uh, which for all that its failures at that time had enormous promise if only the people there at the time had seen it. I mean, that's a great tragedy that Ireland got its independence, you might say, between two world wars when the world was distracted in all kinds of ways. And nobody gave us a, a, a dig out. Nobody really was interested in our plight, even though we were floundering there in the Atlantic, uh, you know, drowning. Yeah. And, and and then you see the problem with that was that when we got onto the 50s, it was more or less decided that Ireland was a failed entity, when in fact it had never been tested as a going concern. We never got an opportunity to actually get a good bunch of leaders in with a, you know, an opportunity and maybe a little bit of help from their friends to make a go of this country, which isn't that difficult to run really if you if you know what you're doing, I think. And, and there are people out there who do. The only problem is that in the era of the European Union, those people are the last people who would go into politics. Politics was the last thing they wanted to know about because politicians, as they saw it, were simply messenger boys for Europe. And they didn't want to play that game. They, who wants to, if you're, if you're a, a smart businessman or whatever you might be, you know, you, you don't want to be t- t- given orders by somebody like uh, van der Leyen, Leyen or whatever it is, and, and, and these guys over in Brussels. So... That's what we are. We, we're this is there's a kind of a, a downward spiral effect that comes from this kind of uh, supranationalism, and uh, we're actually that the really uh, we're getting the lash of it all. Uh, it, 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 you know, we're getting the really the thin end, of the, the, the 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 hard end of the stick in every single respect that you could possibly think of. Yeah, and um, I think what a lot of people don't realize is that we actually have ample 
um, natural resources for a population of our size. Mm. Uh, an incredible amount, really. And I think the average, in, in the mind of the average Irish person, we are, we have nothing. We have nothing, and that, that's why we need these. We need these foreign countries, these larger countries, with all that's their right. resources to, to mind that's, us. That's right, and and people think that you know, oh, they give us oh, look, we wouldn't have any roads, but if they hadn't built them for us and this sort of stuff, you know, well, actually, we might be better off with the. I've, I wrote a book called uh, "Give Us Back the Bad Roads," and and that's kind of part of what it's saying, you know, that that can we actually just have what we had when we started with you, our independence back, our sovereignty back. And we'll take our chances, mm-hmm. and and I think that we we have the people. You see, the, one of the great tragedies of Ireland is that our our population has been hemorrhaging for 180 years, uh, and that means that you know a lot of our smartest, smartest, and most energetic and most adventurous people have been leaving. I don't say everybody, but but uh, you know yeah. it's quite a lot, and they've been building other nations, America, Britain, and so on, and and uh, you know that's. You know, that, that's now actually, this is the extraordinary paradox of this, uh, Shane, that that's now used as a stick to beat us. Well, you know, the Irish went all over the world as if like <laughs> we went to stay in five star hotels instead of going to risk our lives building skyscrapers. You know, yeah. like this sort of guff that you get from these sli- sleaze bags of politicians, uh, you know, that, that, that the humiliation and the debasement of Ireland is now put, held up to, 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 to us. Uh, the, their successors, uh, as though they were done some great favour, and that we have to pay that favour back by giving our country away to the globalists. Yeah, because that's what it amounts to. Yeah, it's constant. You you get that thrown in your face all the time, all the time, and it's it's so illogical. You wonder how can they kind of keep thinking like that? Do you foresee a cultural revival in Ireland, like a renewed interest in the past? Oh yeah. 100% I do. It's already happening, Shane, I think. You know, I think in a certain sense, this is, you know, maybe in a certain sense, this moment of, of horror and, and, and awfulness has been, was necessary in order to achieve that. Because it's only in the, that moment of extremists that people begin to really appreciate what they didn't have, what they lost. I mean, I've seen, you know, people like, you know, musicians singing old songs now, you know, in front of audience, and they're absolutely wrapped to hear these songs and and to sing along with them they know some of them you know already in a little way and mm-hmm. this is really interesting and I, I see a massive revival in these really appalling circumstances of the irish language of irish music of uh, interest in in the truth about irish history uh, you know in the the writings of people like pierce and and mcdonough and those guys and and i i can see if we can the, the big problem there of course is culturally that the entire infrastructure of the arts in Ireland is bought and paid for by the globalists. So we need to create new theatres, new magazines, you know, new new publishers uh, in order to actually have that parallel culture. And of course, they will try to extinguish it in the way that they try to extinguish any scintilla of opposition to what they're doing at the moment. But we can we can do it because I mean in, in other countries where this kind of totalitarian thing happened, that was really much a feature. Like in Russia, like the Samistat revolution in Russia, which kept the spirit of of freedom alive in, in for seventy years. Like it, that that's something that we shouldn't discount as a possibility. Although I, I won't be around for the the latter end of those seventy years. Saying you know I might be I yeah. might have to I might have to head <laughs> off somewhere around the. The, 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 early, uh, the first decade or so but you know I, I will certainly be, be happy to see it but it's already beginning I see it comedy you know I see you know poetry all these things are beginning to manifest already and they're not mm-hmm. coming from the old guard who are completely bought and paid for they're new people new people the younger people who are really aware of these things in some kind of I don't know how, how it got to them some osmotic way they received this sense of Ireland despite the culture that was bearing down upon them of, of you know, uh, deracination and globalism and all this stuff, you know. So, yeah, I, I do feel very strongly, I think, that, that we're, this, this is one of the good things about this. I wish it didn't have to happen so that it would mm-hmm. take, uh, that, that, to, to make this happen, as of, that we didn't have to go through this hell in order for this to happen. But now that it is, that we've had to do it, we can at least, you know, uh, reap the harvest of it. Yeah, and the same guy who was uh, interested in that question wants to know, um, 
he'd like he'd love to hear you comment on the on the late John Moriarty. Oh yeah, John was a wonderful guy. I mean, he, I, I met John several times and I really liked him a lot. And uh, he was a brilliant, brilliant philosopher and a brilliant, you know, his understanding of Ireland mythologically and, and poetically and, and philosophically was really extraordinary. And, uh, you know, I think, again, his writings, you know, they're there still. They're not widely read, but there, a lot of people know about him and have read, read quite a lot of his work. And uh, and I think that that will undergo a massive revival now because that's I think that's fundamentally what he was about was to try to find, as it were, the the kind of the the, the center of of the Irish spiritual tradition and the Irish spiritual kind of imagination, and I think that that's something that's vital in in the next phase because you know we're up against completely soulless forces who will try to desoul us that's their project and so we need to seek out people like john again and elevate them and mm -hmm. i mean make sure that their books become more and more available and also people like patrick cavanagh you know whose books are not as available as they should be you know because of various circumstances to do with copyrights and so on but with the we need to start to look to those things you know i think you know we're still kind of at the weekend, as it were, of all this, you know, that, that we haven't faced the Monday morning when we need to begin to really, we've been fighting fires all the time. Yeah. And we're postponing the moment of initiation when we have to start rebuilding our parallel nation, our parallel people, our parallel society. And, you know, that's going to be hard work. It's going to take a long time. We're going to, but we're going to have to, I think that we're going to have to do it one day at a time. We don't, let's not think of it as 70 years of, of slog. Let's think of it as, you know, one day of beautiful new discoveries, of new energies, new people coming to, to light and, and, and defiance of all of these appalling people who set themselves up over us without our authority, without our permission, without any consultation, dictating to us and then, you know, smarming their way around the world, pretending to be Democrats. We have to put an end to this. We have to get rid of the Vrad creeps and the Harrises and these guys. We have to cleanse our, our system of all of these, you know, viruses, uh, Fina Fall virus, Fina Gale virus, you know, Labour virus. All of these viruses have to be, you know, purged from our system because they are tre treasonous and evil and we cannot go on with them we really can't mm -hmm. so what do you think of your opponents then in your constituency um i was asked to get you to to describe them in three words and i have a list well can i just do a little <laughs> bit of a preamble on that because you see do I, I i actually my wife is be telling me who i'm up against their names and I, none of them well very few of the names mean anything to me whatsoever but i i say to her every day because i don't want to know who they are i don't care because i'm not really running against anybody you know i'm running as myself i'm running on a question and uh, not an issue i hate that word issue but on a on the question can ireland prosper by its own lights i think so and i want to find people out there who share that hope and that certainty and and therefore if 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 they do then they'll vote for me you know and and give me that chance to to, to do whatever it takes to initiate that i can't i don't think i can do much more than initiate it or help to initiate it someone more forces to this project or something like it and so I'm not really competing against anybody in particular. I don't, they, they're out there. I mean, obviously, they would be looking for votes as well. And that's fine. But if people want to vote for, you know, whoever it might be instead of me, then that's their choice. And that I can I'll have to consider that at the end of, it, of this and say, well, that that was what the verdict was, you know, and, and uh, I will try to persuade people. But at the end of the day, I, I, I can only say what I believe. I can only say what I know and what I see. And what I fear, what I fear if we don't act pretty quickly now. So, but nevertheless, I can, I can, I, it's an interesting game you're proposing. Uh, so, as far as I know anybody, I might be able to play it. I don't know. Let's try. So, let's start with, uh, with, with Ming Flanagan. Describe in three words. Uh, I would say intelligent dogged absent excellent um kieran mulhooly 
Brass necked, that's two. Um, RTE, is that a word? Yeah, I think that'll RTE, do. I think everyone will know. RTE, QED. <laughs> um, Barry Cowan. Brother of Brian. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, Lisa Chambers. Two faced. That's two. Um, improbable. Improbable. I, 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 I don't understand uh, what she could possibly bring to the party that we are going to be going to, if it, you can call it a party. Mm -hmm. uh, Marie Walsh. Ditto. Uh, one. Um, again, absent. Um, and uh, Rose. Rose. Rose of Tredi. Oh, okay, okay. That's true. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Nina Carberry. I have no idea who she is. Okay. And then finally, Niall Blaney. Um, yeah, I would say a force to be reckoned with. Um, I don't, uh, you know. Blaney, Blaney, the Blaney family is a formidable political family, uh, undoubtedly. Whether they're, they're, they've got a place to play in the present moment or a role to play in the present moment is something I don't really know. I, 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 I can't see it really at the moment, but I could be wrong. Because, of course, sorry, this is more than three, three words, but, uh, you know, it's, it's like um, the whole Sinn Féin thing and the way that that's gone where the, a party that was originally nationalist Republican went globalist. You know, you can get hooked into that conflict and, and, as well and, and, and kind of continue being like associated with it. And, and Neil Blaney was very much associated with, uh, you know, the, the troubles in the North and so on. And, th and that, that has lessons for us for now in this moment, but we're not learning them. We're not paying attention. So someone like Neil, Neil could, could, could become an interesting voice in that context i think uh I, you know i wouldn't certainly wouldn't write him off i think he's he's a very interesting character you know so i think it's it's a matter of i think this moment is going to be belong to people in these in these categories you know I, that's my great hope anyway that we will see a complete rout of the, the traditional parties in all of these elections european a local and eventually in the general election. I mean, there's no reason why why people should be electing anybody from Fianna Fáil, Fine Gael, Labour, uh, anybody who was in the Dáil in March 2020 when they brought they brought fascism in by law, by an mm -hmm. enabling act, if I may say so, an enabling act that was introduced then, uh, announcing a spurious emergency in order to imprison people and to to break their spirits. Um, so I, you know, I, 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 I would definitely, you know, I, I would, I, I'm, I'm celebrating people who are independent-minded, uh, and who are, no matter even if they don't agree with me about this or that, you know, I, I think that that's kind of what we need now is new voices, different voices, variant, variegated voices, and uh, courageous voices that can actually overcome this present climate of tyranny, which is so is directed at shutting people up. That are, they, they, but in that context, we just have to talk non-stop, all of us, together, if necessary. Yeah, similarly, my deep hope and suspicion for the next general election here in Ireland is that we will see uh, a big upset of the usual order. And I think um, I think some of the... Um, I actually had somebody, somebody on my last stream, um, a Sinn Féin voter, he was kind of saying that I was trying to discourage people, even though I'd never met Sinn Féin, or never mentioned Sinn Féin during the stream. But I think there seems to be some kind of a, there's a small group of people who are holding on to their parties, despite it all, but can see it. And they, 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 they there seems to be like an agitation at realizing, yeah, no, Sinn Féin aren't who I have attached myself to. They aren't who I used to think they were. And the same, you know, the, the Fianna Fallers and the Fianna Gaelers are in the same boat. But what is that? What is that reluctance to let go? 
it's tribal I guess uh, it's tribal i guess and you know you've staked your whole sort of identity on a particular you know particularly in 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 the countryside and in small towns people become known for their allegiance and they don't let go of it lightly uh, the one exception to that was in 2011 when people voted basically against Fianna Fáil to a high degree and but they've gone back now to 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 some extent uh, and that's kind of faded a little bit um, Sinn Féin are a different problem I mean Sinn Féin uh, really appear to have flipped their political model their ideological model almost yeah. you could almost identify a day I might actually go into this at some point try to find the day in 1998 just after they the Good Friday Agreement, I would say, before their or, or dash would came, I think within a couple of weeks, uh, that they basically flipped their model from, uh, you know, Republican nationalism to George Soros open borders, uh, yeah. that was a new brand, and and they've been plowing that for, and it was all like feminism and you know, gay and all this stuff, and uh, it's a mystery beyond beyond, you know. Uh, uh, beyond my, I can't really, you know, get to the bottom of it. Other than that, you know, as I said to 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 Niall McConnell on the on the stream there recently, that you can't that rumor that used to be going around that Sinn Fein were always that the provisionals were always uh, an MI five psychological operation with a view to deracinating the Irish people and destroying and their, smearing their patriotic history and their flag and their anthem, everything about them. And they sure did, they went a long way towards achieving that, if you can call it an achievement. Uh, and that that therefore, that it make, in that context, then it makes sense that when that project was drawn to a close by the Good Friday Agreement, they just simply, you know, said, well, what are we gonna do now? Well, okay, let's start a new business called uh, Open Borders. Yeah. Yeah, this doesn't seem to be many options left. You know, when you, when you look at the evidence, you're kind of left with, with nothing le nothing else but a conspiracy when you see how strongly it flipped um, yeah it was it was you know it was in my early teens but i'm old enough to remember what it used to mean to be a Sinn Féin supporter um oh, yeah. like yeah. the image of that used to mean it used to mean something and now it just to me it just means you're deluded or something well, I don't it, know what it, it, it meant a lot i tell you someone uh, shane i mean if you know it would take a long time to go through it like but you know, when I was a journalist, a young, you know, journalist in Dublin back in the in the eighties, like, you know, there was a kind of really strong divide, which reflected a divide a divide out in the society, and which was to some extent kind of Dublin versus the rest, or maybe Leinster versus the rest, where because you know, Connacht certainly was very much Republican, uh, uh, Munster to a high degree too, with Johnny Gall, of course, Kevin Monaghan, yes, uh, but. You know, in, in journalistic terms, I mean, there was a huge kind of revisionist thing, you know, which partly was to do with the excesses of the provost, or at least it was leverage in those, the, the bombings in, in, in England and so on. There's appalling, you know, atrocities that they did commit. Uh, but at the same time, there was a kind of a certain sentiment among people in the countryside and among some journalists that notwithstanding the kind of uh, um, excesses, that the cause of provisionals was a just one. And for that reason, people sometimes with, with gritted teeth supported them to the extent of act, trying to give them a voice. And I mean, we had this whole saga about Section 31, which was the, 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 the Broadcasting Act, which, which barred Sinn Féin from access to the airways. And they had this ridiculous thing on RT where they used to have an actor uh, reading out the words of Jerry Adams, you know? And the actor mightn't even have a, the actor mightn't even have a beard, you know, like that. It was that ridiculous, like, uh, and um, you know, but I because I and then I knew journalists, friends, or colleagues of mine, like, and and who who were really close to people in the north who were really deeply embedded in in the provisionals, like, were members of the move of the IRA and involved in active service and. Like, you know, I, I learned through him and that, that these guys were just like us in certain ways, but they had a particular, you know, the experience and a particular cultural journey and, 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 and that was their lives and they believed in it. And, and, and the one thing that seemed clear to me was that you couldn't unpick this. You couldn't ever set this to rights 
without allowing these people to speak their minds and to be heard and to be to be listened to in the society. And that's what I, I did as a journalist a lot for years. And I got into a lot of trouble with the other side, you know, the kind of, you know, the, 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 the guys who were on dry land up on the higher ground, you know, uh, uh, telling us what we, you know, about the moral, uh, the morality of this, which we knew full well about. But, you know, we were saying something else that, you know, notwithstanding the moral questions that, that confront us, which are not particularly easy to solve, uh, that, that there is this problem that we need to fix this, all of us together. You know, not just that wasn't our responsibility as, as such, but it was part of our responsibility, or we were part of the responsibility of doing it, and we tried to do that. And there was a lot of flak flying against us, people like us. And uh, you know, to then come round after all that and find that Sinn Fein, whom we'd kind of gone out on a limb for, had become a totally globalist party. Who wanted, you know, the, 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 the slogan goes, uh, you know, the Brits out, everybody else in type of thing, you know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, uh, you know, like that was a really hard thing to swallow, particularly when the next thing they were parroting these cliches about racism and so on, which were completely fabricated and important tropes, which had nothing to do with Irish history whatsoever. And these guys were supposed to be the experts in Irish history because they had mm. studied. Ill, hadn't they? And uh, in, in Long Kesh. And, and, you know, like I, I think, I mean, uh, for a long time, I thought that what had happened in Sinn Fein was that when the men were in, interned in jail in, in Long Kesh in the Hitch blocks in the 80s, that the women outside became militant, became radicalized by, by Marxism. And that that actually, in the absence of a lot of the leading men, you know, caused the movement to become radicalized along feminist lines and that this gradually then extended itself to the full uh, gamut of the, the the movement's thinking because remember the provisionals were originally a nationalist irish catholic movement you know rory O'Brady, that the early uh, ira leader was really like traditionalist in his outlook he was from roscommon mm -hmm. like same so county as myself and i knew him and he was a very interesting character, but he was like a ruthless soldier, also. Like these guys weren't like they were they were not playing around, you know, and, and, and some terrible things were done. But you know, there was a lot of people at that time who were just willing to kind of pontificate as opposed to try to kind of bring these forces together. And eventually that seemed to be happening. Right. It seemed to be happening. And I say this now in a certain guarded way, because I'm not even sure, given what the way that Sinn Féin have turned out, that what happened in the Good Friday Agreement was in any way sincere or genuine. I really don't know that it wasn't all constructed for the benefit, the consumption of the public. But certainly what's happened under Mary Lou MacDonald uh, and, you know, and those those people now, it bears no relationship whatsoever to any of this history. And it has to be a slap in the face, not just for, you know, the, the ancient uh, patriots. I mean, going back to 16 and beyond, uh, 1916 and beyond. Those, I mean, God knows what they would make of all this. But, <laughs> you know, for, for all those guys who, who in the hunger strikers in the 1980s, they, the guys who just died obediently for what they believe was the struggle for Irish freedom. And now to find that the, their, their, their successors are handing Ireland over to the globalists under the guise of being compassionate to people from Africa, which is nonsense. It's lies. Because i got to say to those guys, if you want to be compassionate to people of, of Africa, there's another 1.5 billion of them waiting to come over. So you better get to it. Yeah. Yeah, it's a betrayal. Um, so the next two questions, I have two questions that are sort of in the same vein. So I'm going to read them both out, and you can answer them both together as, as you see fit, right? So the first question is, if John gets elected, what does he plan to do as an MEP? Details appreciate as, as there aren't uh, many dissenting voices there, so there's not a clear example of how to be effective there. Good guys generally get ignored, and the powers that shouldn't be, that, you know, are. Then the other yeah. question is, well, you can answer that if, you, if you'd like before I, I do the second question. Well, the first thing I'd say is that... Um... It, 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 being an MEP can be or could be or should be and it is for Christine Anderson and people like that uh, a platform that that you get to amplify what you have to say by virtue of that having bearing that uh, title and 
you know, I've, I've for, for the last four years, I've been writing an enormous amount about what's been happening to Ireland. And I have many analysis of all that, which are on my Substack. But, it, you know, I, and I have some books in the works as well. But, you know, I want to, you know, what we need above all is, and it's not just me, we need lots of voices to go out from here. And other, I'm from everywhere else, and start speaking for the real sentiment, speaking the real sentiment of the people, speaking the the true feelings of the people, and the experience of the people, and what this is really about. You know, I mean, you know, like I'll give you an example, Shane. I won't go into the details of this because it's a bit murky, and and there's a lot of stuff to happen yet. But I've got a vicious attack there during the, the week and uh, on Twitter. And uh, I've heard about it, I don't do Twitter, so I only hear about these things second hand, you know. But the, one of the, 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 this particular individual put up this appalling post about me and, and then doubled down. And when people said, you know, this is ridiculous, you know, he, he used a video that I've done in which I say so, something like, a clip from a video where I say that we don't have a mass immigration problem, we have a mass treason problem. Uh, which I think is 100% the, the, the way that it is. Like, if this wouldn't be happening if we didn't have traitors in, in office. And, and he thought this was proof that I was a nutcase. Now, here is the problem, you see, that when you have a society in which the official voices are so loud and the mainstream media is so corrupt that people never hear what's in their own hearts, then you've got a real problem. Everything becomes sclerotic. Everything becomes frozen. And and that's what's happened. And everybody is kind of muted, although that's kind of, I think, toying out now. And, and people are finding their tongues again a little bit. The referendums tell us that. So I, I what I would like to do is to get that use the first of all, the, use the platform, use the, to be able to reflect back into my country, but also be able to, to what I'm saying about Ireland and what's happening in it, really. And also, but but above all, to actually address those guys, the, the van der Leyers and all these people over in Brussels. This is we're not taking it anymore. It's not. I, I, it's going to be like, to my mind, it's that it's purely. If people remember that that movie uh, Network back in the, I think it was seventies, uh, Peter Finch when he was a, a star presenter, news presenter on on a, a TV show, and uh, in the end, like he 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 he's gone crazy about because things are so terrible, and and in the end, he has all the people in America in the movie in the final scenes like. Putting their heads out the window of wherever they live and shouting, "We're mad as hell, and we're not going to take it anymore." Well, we need a moment somewhat analogous to that in Ireland, yeah. and I think every other country as well. And that's what I want to do: is to pr bring that with whoever I can bring with me, in, in, in by way of allies or whatever. And you know, I'm, there are people who who are talking about moving or going as well. You know, uh, I'll tell you a couple that I've heard. Uh, 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 Dr. Jerry Waters is uh, the, the doctor who was suspended by the Medical Council for speaking the truth about the COVID scam. He, he is talking about going. Uh, Kevin Sharkey, who's going, I believe, is, up, uh, is going. Uh, that's an amazing thing, I think, that yeah. Kevin, uh, extraordinarily articulate and uh, passionate man, uh, wonderful artist. And uh, so, you know, that, this, is, this is a revolutionary moment. It's not. We're. Not, I'm not going for a, to start a political career. I'm going to start trouble. Yeah. That's. You know. I. I don't want to get elected for getting the sake of getting elected. And I, as I, I kind of to put what I said earlier, the same. You know, to reemphasize it. You know. I, I'm not looking to get elected on any terms. If people don't like what I say, then that's absolutely fine. Don't vote for me. You know, I'm not going to change what I say to make to persuade you to vote for me. But if you think that, that what I'm saying bears a resemblance to reality as you understand it, then I think you should vote for me. That's that's all I can say. And if I don't win, then I, the message I'll take from that, if I don't get through, the message I'll take from that, well, we're not ready yet to actually do what needs to be done to save our country. Mm -hmm. And people don't put enough credence, I don't think, in the power of having a dissenting voice at all. They think they see the they see the power of it being in winning people over. Whereas mm. there's also there's also a power in letting people realize that there are other people in the world who think the way they do, and then people I, become braver. I I think that's so essential. I think that the courage is the most vital thing, you know, uh, and that that means having the courage first of all for one person to speak out, because then others can say, you know, they least they listen and they listen quietly, 
They might go home and think about it, but the next day they feel emboldened maybe a little bit to say. And then the funny thing about speaking is that it gets, it's contagious within yourself. You know, the more you speak, the more courage you get. And mm -hmm. this is something that they did that they, the last decade in particular, really in Ireland, I would say certainly since, yeah, 2014, 2014, that was when the LGBT goons first launched attacks on, on Irish culture, on Irish people, and really told them, that, okay, you don't have any say in this now. We're doing this. We want it. You shut up or we're going to destroy you. And not only that, we're going to turn your children against you because we mm. can do that. We have that hip power. We're trendy, you know. That was the vibe. And, and as a result of that, people have been literally locked-jawed ever since. And I, I kind of want to get people free from that. You know that um, you know that they, they they can they go get back get back that sort of mojo of being able to speak their minds the way they were twenty years ago. Irish people were the most argumentative people on the planet. You know, like you, you couldn't avoid an argument no matter where you went. You know, people just contradicted you as a matter of course just f to wind you up and to start a, f a bit of an argument. That's what we need to get back to. And it, well, you see, everything that you look at uh, here, Shane, if you look at everything that's going on in every under every heading virtually, it's hate speech and, you know, EU digital services and, and you know, everything is, 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 is about shutting people up. Everything now, no matter who, and everybody thinks, all these people in power think it's a good idea to shut people up. And it's a remarkable thing. Because I remember when, when back about then, let's say in 2014, the internet, Twitter was far nastier then than it is now, and far less constructive then than it is now, in my opinion, from what I saw. But, mm -hmm. And yet these same creeps in power didn't want to do anything about it. Because at the time it suited them, because they needed to get these things done to destroy the, certain elements within the constitution in Ireland, for example. And so I, I, I think we, we're we on the point now after their referendum that people are, they've sent a signal that they're ready to, to answer back. They just maybe haven't got the courage totally yet, or they don't know how to find the, you know, finding your tongue. You remember that phrase from, you know, that your child, from your childhood, like, you know, that you yeah. kind of find. We need to find our tongue as a people now until these guys, you know, you know, sling your hook before you, before. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's what we need to tell them. And, and make it clear that, that is, this is not a joke and this is not, they, they don't own Ireland. The political parties don't own Ireland. Political parties are nothing unless we vote for them. And if we don't vote for them, they will die on the vine. They will die. And that's what needs to happen. And this next guy had a question. It's in the same vein. So you've answered parts of his question already, but I'll read it out regardless. Um, Hi, John. I'm wondering why would you decide to leave the grassroots where the problems exist on a daily basis and have been magnified over the past couple of years? Why would you think it's best to go to the European Parliament, which is an international body and deals with international issues? Surely you would be best in your local constituency where you would be better utilized for dealing with the many local issues. How do you propose you will be... Uh, you, you, you will make a profound impact for Irish people's lives and livelihoods by taking a seat in an international body. Thank okay. you for your time. I wish you well in the future. It's a good, que it's a good question. Uh, and, and I can't, I'm not sure I can tell the full answer to it, but, but just bear with me and, and maybe read between the lines. Um, then we don't know when the next general election is going to be. It, it, it could be September. It could be next month. I mean, uh, Harris might decide that this is his best chance. He's never going to have any chance, but but this is, you know, he's going to have to be looking for the best moment. And the problem with that is, you know, that he, the longer you let it go on, then the less choices you have, because they have to have an election by March at the latest, next March. And, you know, as, as it gets closer, then you run out of options. You know, you run out of uh, uh, what you might call uh, choices. Uh, so, so we don't know. The thing is that there's a mo there's an opportunity happening now. There's an energy now arising from those referendums that there's like people are alert and they're talking again, and that won't last, you know. So we we need to capitalize on that moment now, and and it just so happens that the nearest opportunity to do that is in the European elections, 
you know, I, I take on board what, what the, the, the limitations, you know, because and, and it's very true, you know, that when, you know, when people get elected generally in Ireland to the European Parliament, they disappear for five years. You never see them again. You never hear about them. You think they're dead. And then five years later, they appear again and they're suddenly all full of life and looking for votes again. And they're telling you about all this stuff that they did, which nobody can remember. And because it didn't happen, because they just went out and filled in their expenses and sat there. That's that's the impression you get. Uh, so I, I take that on board. But I think that, first of all, I think that there's a ways of using the platform creatively to, to make Ireland's voice heard in Europe. And, and, and in a skeptical way and a critical way to speak in relation to issues that, you know, I mean, what's happening now, this, this, this uh, pandemic treaty, like, you know, that, that, well, that's going to be possibly even passed before the election. But nobody's doing anything about that. We need to be joining forces with those uh, dissident groups within the, the European Parliament already to try to give them more muscle and make more noise. Uh, but things like the, the the turf cutting thing, the the fish thing, the banking thing, the currencies, the euro is going to collapse before long. There's no question about it, and the implications of that are absolutely catastrophic. They're they're un, they're unimaginable in in the context of social collapse and so on. And this is a really terrifying moment if it, when it comes. Uh, so the international issues you know neutrality where ireland's neutrality has been sold by these guys these gangsters that we we voted in and they just assume i mean like simon harris tells us he went over to meet Zelensky, and that he promised him that ireland would be 100 percent behind uh, ukraine who told him that that, that ireland was 100 percent behind ukraine yeah. i don't remember voting for that i don't i don't yeah, remember yeah. That asking me what I want to do about Ukraine, you know. Uh, so we needed all these international issues as well. But then, then you see, what, there's also this other t t tactical dim dimension, because if we can do well in the European elections, that will really give a, a bounce to independent candidates in the general election. And, you know, out of all this, I, you can already, already see that new movements are forming you know, uh, independent Ireland and all these, you know, the people, the Irish people, these movements starting to uh, you sprout up, green shoots, you know, and this will be an opportunity, the election, the, Europe, in the European and the local elections will let us to see a lot of those green shoots and how they're coming along. And then hopefully when the, uh, the general election comes along, all of us, including those who have or have not been elected to the European Parliament, will be in a better position to exploit that moment to the, to the full. Because as I said before, you know, I've, I've been talking about this a lot, and I think I talked talk to you about it, Sean, this idea of the, what happened in 2011, you know, uh, the auto call pay, you know, that, that what happened on that occasion was that um, uh, when that energy was there before, after the Troika, and people were really livid with their politicians, their political leaders, and then this movement came in and, and stood there in the doorway and blocked it up for, for several weeks at a critical moment when all these other movements might have started to move. And instead, they hogged the space and hogged the, uh, the moment. And then they disappeared. Yeah. Uh, too short a notice. If we'd had another three weeks, we'd have been OK. But, you know, too short. Like, as if like there's anything to going for election other than just going for election. The rest is just gravy, you know, posters mm. and that stuff. Just put your name up and your face and say, I'm here now. That's all you have to do. You don't need to do anything else. This idea is amazing, actually. I found in, when I, in, in various times when I got involved in political issues, like, uh, in, very, like in one referendum there, myself and a couple of friends of mine, in the, in the marriage referendum in 2015, we, we, we actually created a movement, which was short-lived, but it did its job, which is called First Families First. And it was literally to fight that issue, to protect families which had disintegrated, but which they had left children you know, in a situation of limbo and that they needed to be protected in, in the context of their, 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 their uh, uh, legal rights. And, you know, we, we're... So that, so that, you know, you, you can... You can do all kinds of stuff that you need, you know, in, in, in politics that that needs to be done in by, you know, you know, becoming involved in without any big resources. But uh, the first question that we used to be asked in any press conference you did, there would always be some idiot from the Irish Times say, who's funding you? You know, where are you getting your funding from? And, you know, 
uh, one of us was, would be three of us at the table, and one would say, well, I've just come up from Cork and I paid my own fare. And another one would say, well, I'm after buying the coffees. You know, and the other guy, I, well, I paid for the rent for the room for the day. And that's actually the way it was. And that's in, that's what I mean about politics. This is the people. When I, when I use the term like uh, citizen politician, it's for the word citizen I'm using it. The word politician is is so besmirched and so contaminated. But it, there's nothing, there's there's no synonym for politician. So other, if there was, I would use it. Uh, and but we, this is something that we need to to get people to understand that it's our country. It's our it's our country. We are the sovereign people. We've given it over to these franchises, which have turned into criminal organizations, which are selling our country by the pound. Either because they're being they're making you know making big money on backhanders, or because they're they are such dirt birds that these guys have serious compromise on them. It doesn't matter which it is. The result of it will be that our children will 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 lose their metaphysical home, and we better stop that happening. I, I, I don't want to shuffle off my, this mortal coil of mine uh, and leave that mess behind. I want to make this make sure this goes no further than the next year or two, and that by then we will actually have these guys on the run and we will have control for the people. The sovereign people of Ireland will be again in control of their country through whatever representatives, but that these representatives will never again, will know they can never again allowed to happen what has happened to these major parties, which is the profound corruption by money and power and exter external forces pulling their strings. It does make you wonder what you're dealing with when people, when something that seems so um, beyond the pale or like disgusting to you is something that they're willing to engage in all the time. Um, mm. this kind of like selling on of the country and they're uh, betraying their ancestors and so on. What is that? Mm. What like it feels uh, like you're not dealing with it like with a, a human. Yeah, well, that's right. You know, because there is that mystery that is in, it's inexplicable. Because even like in the last few days now, you see again that they're doubling down now by the mig signing up to the migration pact. Even though there's that clip going around, very very interesting clip from RTE where. There's a they're rather inexplicably RT people never ask for answer ask an audience a question they don't know the answer to. But this one that they got an answer they didn't like. They asked like how many people would support this the migration Ireland's signed up to the migration park and uh, yes nobody, no everybody. <laughs> you know and and yeah. so so like in the face of that what happens that these creeps they double down and say we're doing it because everybody's behind us they lie and lie. And so they, that, that tells you that it's not just even about money because they must have enough money made by now to see them out. So it must be the compromise issue. That more and more you got to see that. And when you see the kind of, you know, filth they're pushing on, on children and so on, that kind of confirms that in some way. So, because, you know, I mean, like there, there, there's really serious attempts now to make paedophilia legal. That, that's the next thing. That's part of the, 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 uh, the agenda. Like, you know, the, the, the P will one day, that LGBTP, whatever, one day you'll, everybody will wake up and there'll be a P there in the middle of it. Yeah. And they'll say, yeah, that's right. You know, the children have a right to a sexual life, you know. That, that, that's what they'll do. And, and, and uh, like, the, again, that's it. That's, you, you know, now, okay, this idea of evil. Of course, it's evil, but to go further than that and say this is satanic, you know, that kind of rattles people's cages a bit. You know, uh, and I don't say I don't. There's I, I I don't seek to gainsay that because I do believe that that uh, evil is an actual force. It is an actual real thing, and that it can actually influence people. It can actually get a grip of a society or a family or. You know, because but there are all kinds of forces within that little, uh, you know, under undertoes that that kind of work together to make that happen, and I, that's what I'm interested in, rather than just baldly stating it's satanic, because that that kind of turns some people off. It doesn't really explain much. It just kind of creates a certain feeling, which is fine. But it's probably accurate. Uh, but I, I, I prefer to be able to sort of see how does this dynamic work? Like how much of it is money? How much of it is fear of being found out? 
how much of it is 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 lack of of care, lack of love for your country, which is a real problem. I mean, we've had many decades now of of a politi- of an education system which has really worked hard to deracinate our people and to treat to tell them that you know this Ireland is what Michal Martin said is old fashioned notion of sovereignty, you know, except for Ukraine. Sorry, I, I want to make that clear. Like obviously that if you Ukraine are entitled to their sovereignty and their, 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 that's essential. We'll fight to the death to the last Irish man for that. But Irish sovereignty, backward idea, you know? <laughs> yeah, backward. yeah, yeah. Yeah. It is so, a bit of... Is, go for it, Gwen. No, no, I think that's, that's what I think uh, we, we're... Um, I think that's that's kind of where we are now, that, 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 that these guys... They've pushed it at a very limit. I think they're at their limit now in terms of their capacity, the brass neck thing. I think they 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 really are at their limit, and that uh, there's always a moment like that, you know, where the the enemy is fully extended, and and there's a disarray starts to set in. Then they start to kind of you know have to regroup a little bit, and at that moment of regrouping, you can always you can take them. This could be it. I don't. I actually don't know that the European elections will be the culmination. You know, I mean, if I don't get, well, I'll put it very starkly. I mean, to answer the earlier question, maybe fully. You know, if I'm not elected in Europe, I, I, I'll definitely be running for the doll. Now, I didn't want to do that. Uh, you know, I did it before; it was a mistake. But I definitely will be doing it in a different place than the last time. I went in Dunleary last year, which is, you know, uh, not a great idea. Uh, but I wanted to just. <laughs> make a statement of something of some kind and i made it and uh, i didn't enjoy a second of it um but that's that's it and and i, I but I, I i this is now you know i'm not it's, it's, i don't get people into the people shouldn't get into the idea that i want to go to, to to brussels or strasbourg and that's what i want to do with the rest of my life that's not what this is about it's about availing of this moment and creating an activity that will rattle the system and out of which that people, other people will be inspired, hopefully, to see, well, if he can do that, then I can do it, and I can do it maybe better. And, and you know, that's that's what I, this is what it's about. It's not, the end game is not election. That's just the beginning of a process that will go on now for a few years, and which at the end of which, I hope that we will have our country back in the hands of decent, honourable Irish people. And that we will undo as much as possible of the appalling things that have been done to us in the last decade or so. Mm. Um, would you um, would you consider or would you speak on um, trying to figure out the real reason for the continuing excess deaths that we're experiencing? Yes, um, I, I definitely would want to do that. Um, I definitely would want to do that. Uh, but there's there are issues there that I, I don't want to I don't want to alarm people. I mean, I'm not a doctor, so I can't speak, you know, uh, necessarily with great authority on medical matters. But what I can say is that we were told at the beginning, it was very much a commonplace trope in the very beginning of this, that we wouldn't really know what how bad the pandemic was this is what the authorities the, the creeps were saying that we wouldn't know how bad it was until the excess deaths showed were were visible which would be like a year or two down the line right which was of course a, a postponement technique in order so that people couldn't quest interrogate what was being done just another trick well now here we are and there, the figures are in and what's happened well these guys who were anxious to save every life let leave no one behind. Every life is as valuable. It doesn't matter if you're 177. They would like to see you make 178. They were so anxious about that. And you know, uh, uh, but now the same people, you can be 17 and drop dead and they don't care. They don't want to talk about it. They don't want to discuss yeah. it. Uh, these are the same people. It's a mystery. Uh, and they don't, they can't think what, you know, and then they, you ask them, well, what do you think it's about? And they come up with about a hundred different answers, but the one they leave out is what we all know it to be. And then that's slightly suspicious, you know, if they're, you know, that's called, you know, you're trying to misdirect people. Look at, look at, oh, what, what's the latest one I heard there? Um, 
Oh yeah, uh, light pollution. Light pollution apparently is a big problem. That's causing strokes and heart attacks. Who knew? You know, but this is what the, the press, the, the shameful press is doing. This the media is just disgusting. They're just parroting these lies all the time now. And this has gone on for four years. And this is another thing I, I want to do is to draw attention to this at, at European level because it's Europe, it's a, it's a worldwide problem. But it's particularly a problem in the West, in America, in Canada, in, in, in Australia, New Zealand, Europe. Uh, you know, it's our press is entirely corrupt. Our media they're completely corrupt. And that as a, as a journalist of 40 years, I have, you know, a, a role and a responsibility in that to speak, uh, to describe it, because I have the capacity to describe what, what it's working, how, what, what, what it's like and what its effects are on the culture and the society. This is the amazing thing, though, you know, Shane, that, you know, this is so hard to, to, to this is, again, we're talking about mystery and evil and all that, but, you know, all our lives, all my life, and it's been a long life so far, you know, that everything was directed at the good in the sense that every conversation was directed at finding the best outcome to the situation or whatever the problem being discussed uh, and to make things better. Now it's like the opposite. It's like we, we want to make things worse. It's like we want to destroy things. Our cultures, our political systems want to destroy what's in front of them. They don't want to find creative solutions. They don't want to deal with real problems. I mean, is it, would it have been imaginable like that, that uh, 20,000 people might die extra in the space of three years and uh, in, say, 30 years ago, and nobody would want to talk about it? Of course they would. Mm. 16,000, 17,000 16, 17, a year. That's like, that's like massive numbers, like. Uh, you know, it, it, sorry, not 17 percent, 16, 17 percent every every year. Like, you know, even even like five percent is noticeable and and remarkable. And if it happens two years in a row, then there's something happening. But 16, 17 percent, like that's a catastrophe. And yet we're not discussing it. And at the same time, if you were to say to those guys, you know, well, you know, I, in 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 2020. Well, I don't think that they, there's going to be excess deaths out of this. Well, you know, maybe there might be 5% or something like that. I mean, if there's a serious pandemic. Say, oh, how dare you? Those 5% are, are you're saying, you're, you're just writing off all those lives? This is what you get. Now they're writing off 16, 17% and just shrugging it off. And the same media that terrorized people and abused people who criticized it and called people granny killers and all the rest of it, they're silent. And they're still calling themselves journalists. That's the, the most shocking thing. The most yeah. shocking thing is the, 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 the fundamental you know, misdirection that has been conveyed to people. Because people look to the media for verification of things they suspect or things they hear on the breeze, word of mouth. And when they don't get it, they say, nah, that guy was, nah, nah, he was, he doesn't know. He doesn't know what he's talking about. But he was right. The media is just lying. That's a shocking thing. I mean, and, and that's, so, that's part of what I have to be mindful of, you know, in, in talking that I don't want to scare people who, who, who have been conned into taking these injections. I don't know what's going to happen necessarily to any one of them or all of them even. But I do know something. I do know that this, there's a connection with, with the, the deaths that have occurred so far. And it should be dealt with. It should be talked about. And mm. I am talk about it if i did if i didn't talk about it i mean if i decided pragmatically not to talk about it that would be wrong you know i will be i'll, I'll be as delicate as i can in, in, in dealing with it but it has to be talked about on the same note of dealing with things that uh need to be dealt with delicately um have you heard of or are you interested in uh things such as the kalergi plan and uh, the marshall plan do you know yes. anything about those things? Well, I know about the Carlyle plan uh, better than the Marshall plan, but uh, uh, yes, uh, it seems to me that you know you you would be foolish to to deny that 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 what's happening now doesn't accord with some kind of plan, you know, of you know uh, population replacement, um, population uh, um, reduction, um, 
there's there's strong evidence. I mean, this is but but even if there wasn't, the very fact that they try to stop you using the word replacement should, I think, alert people to the probability that that is what's happening. Because why would they want to stop you talking about it if it was nonsense? They just let you rattle on about this nonsense and just laugh at you. But they want to put you in jail for saying it's replacement because you're a racist. What's yeah. the connection between the word replacement and the word relation? Well, I think the word R is about the one thing I can think of. Exactly. Um, would you um would you ever consider speaking to the local mainstream media to get your message across to a wider audience? Because you're up against some strong candidates in your constituency. Kieran Mulhooly is widely tipped. Well, tipped by whom? You know, yeah, by the uh, mainstream, I guess. Yeah. The answer to the question, Shane, is no. I wouldn't. Uh, I won't because, look. Just take the last four years. I've been involved in lots of things. You know, I've been writing a lot. I've been speaking a lot. I took with, with Jim O'Doherty. I took um, a, a constitutional challenge. These media, not alone, to, to the best. The best they did was when they ignored us. But mostly, they attacked us for actually daring to 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 try to to do something about this. And one or two of them have made approaches to me, and I I don't answer them because. What are we going to talk about? Will we talk about that time you wrote that article making a joke about the fact that we had taken a constitutional action which you didn't even bother to read? You didn't even bother to check the papers? You didn't ask me uh, what we, we were proposing to do? Um, like This was a really an abominable event, you know, that, that we took this action and all the media ganged up in order to make it look idiotic. But without, with, while taking the precaution all the time, not to tell people what was in our submissions. You know, uh, so uh, I don't, uh, like, it, this is the problem. These, this is criminal operation. You know, it's so, it's so serious. Like that, I think I might have talked a bit about this before, but, you know, people need to really enter into this in an, uh, with their whole imaginations and consider the effect of corrupt media. The effect of cor corrupt media is not just, oh, they're all at it, they're all telling lies, and they're, ah, they're, de no, no, it's actually, they're changing reality. They're, they're, they're altering mm -hmm. the very fabric of what you feel, hear and see. In other words, they're building a false state set around you and telling you this is what's happening, this is real. When in fact, what's happening is completely different. And anybody who doesn't sort of see what they've built is a conspiracy theorist and this sort of nonsense. I mean, it's just gibberish. I don't see anybody in that in those in those radio stations or TV stations or newspapers that I would want to talk to about anything. And and I mean uh, that's one thing. And, and and if that means I don't get elected, well, so be it. But. You know, I, I think that we've reached a point of critical mass with our alternative guerrilla media that we can actually reach a sufficiency of people. You know, I don't need to get every vote. You know, if I get whatever, 15, 20% of the overall vote, then that, that will get me over the line. And I think that there's enough people out there now watching uh, and listening to alternative media to make up those numbers. Again, if I'm wrong about that, then that just means it's too early. And, you know, I can live with that. You know, at the end of the day, I, 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 whatever happens, happens. And, and uh, I will do the best I can within the parameters that I'm setting myself. But one of those parameters, and I made it clear to the people who won't ask me to consider to run, I said that under no circumstances would I, would I have anything to do with mainstream media. And they accepted that. Mm. And that's got to be the way it's got to be, you know, because, uh, you know, otherwise it would be a betrayal of one of the most fundamental things I have said from re repeatedly from the beginning of this, that none of this would have been happening, would have been possible. None of this tyranny, none of this abuse, none of this, this murder, none of this anything would have been possible if the media had not signed up to be corrupt. And this hold that the media have over people's reality, it's something that you... It's particularly with your videos, I noticed it in one particular way, and that is, now I haven't actually watched Gemma in a good while. I used to watch her back be just before she ran in Dublin. In my, actually, she's from my constituency, so she ran in my constituency. Just before then, she kind of got uh, removed from YouTube and everything, and I never really found her afterwards. 
But um, I know where she is now, but I just never kind of got that habit back going. But um, so I don't know what she's been up to the last few years. I, I know about your court case. But every time you come on my stream, I get comments from people saying, ask John, is he still friends with Gemma? Um, oh, is that that guy that's friends with Gemma? And for them, that means something because they're such zombies that they've been told that just the, that just being associated with Gemma or mentioning Gemma, that everybody else knows exactly what you mean, that she's the worst what? person in the world. <laughs> and, I, I, and they just I, ask this question as if it's a dismissal of your whole character. I know. Well, I mean, I, we could go into the... I don't know if it would be appropriate now to go into that because it's it's about... This is about propaganda and it's about demonization and it's called scapegoating. That's really fundamentally what it's about. The answer to the question is, yes, I'm still friends with Gemma. In fact, I was speaking to her earlier today. And... Uh, uh, she's in court tomorrow. The, the state is trying to jail her. And, and it may very well succeed tomorrow. It's been trying this now for a long time because she is a real thorn in their side. And that mm -hmm. means something. That means something. That what she's saying and what she's doing is, is making a difference, a good difference. And people need to get over. See, you see, this kind of thing, it's like I was at a meeting recently and there was this guy, a very well-intentioned guy, but he was saying, well, you know, he was talking about the right, which is a concept I don't really like. Uh, I don't think it's true. It's a, it's a correct description of what we're doing at all. But he was saying, oh, it would be better if they, if they were uh, more nicer, you know, more polite. Like, you know, they're very row, loud and rough and out in the, in the streets, you know, at the demonstrations and so on. And I said, well, you know, when you're dealing with kind of profane things, you know, profanity is, is probably the best response. You know, that when you're, you must actually meet what you, you know, you're not going to walk to deal with this by walking around politely and say, please, could we have our country back? We're, we're, we're very upset. You know, like we have to make noise. We have to, you know, we have to say things truthfully. We have to sometimes, you know, overreach in our speech as it were, in, in terms of, you know, exaggeration or, or emphasis or whatever, because we are obviously human beings and we were going to not be, you know, we're not going to be diplomats in, in the course of fighting to get our country back. And and so, in, but in the same token, like Gemma is, is Gemma and, and, and she is like lots of other people have different personalities and that's the way she deals with things. And she, uh, you know, and I totally respect that and I totally respect her. Uh, and uh, uh, you know, she, I, I admire her immensely. She's an extraordinarily courageous woman, um, probably the most courageous person I've ever met in my life. I have to say, and you know, I think that should be honoured in her own country. I think she deserves that honour. And uh, you know, uh, this people people don't seem to realise that what they're picking up is the, the the shrapnel of the attacks on her yeah. by the enemy. You know, this is a very interesting thing that I noticed. Even on our side, you know, during the, 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 when we were taking the constitutional action, that a judge would say something obnoxious to me or to Gemma or to both of us. And this will become headlines in the paper. And then people on our side would throw us back at us as if it were true because a judge had said it. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? Like, so we need to start asking ourselves, where is this prejudicing, prejudicial demonization and, and scapegoating coming from and for what purpose? The reason is because Gemma is a really formidable enemy of the state, of the evil state, the wicked state, not the Irish state uh, qua state, but the people running it now, the criminals who are running it and destroying our country and our children's futures. And Gemma is, the, I would say, the strongest, well, certainly among the strongest voices that we've had. She's been there from the beginning, before the beginning. And I think she should be honoured for that. And I certainly think that if she is put in jail, then the people of Ireland should rise up and, and march to the gates of Mountjoy and pull them off the hinges. Hmm. Yeah, and I'd like the people, you know, I get these comments on my stream, I'd like the people who kind of make these comments to really think, if you're a grown man and you're gloating over the name of a woman, I just want you to think about maybe what it is you are, right? <laughs> like, is there something wrong with you? If you're so indoctrinated um, yeah, this... that you have... Yeah, that's the thing. It is the indoctrination. And, and I mean, you know, you see, we really have to, you know, see beyond all that and, and see that, of course, they're going to say, tell lies about people who are a danger to them. Of course, they're going to smear people who uh, they, they, they want to silence. Uh, 
but you know, like, let's not you like zero in on on some of these examples, like, and ask yourself, was there really anything in that? Was there really anything worth talking about in that? You know, the, this this kind of outrage that is because Jim has say something in you know about somebody or whatever. Like, so what? They're mm-hmm. taking our country away. They're destroying our country. It's not. T- there's no time for niceties here. There's no time for politeness. My problem, frankly, is I'm far too polite. I wish I was, you know, I wish I was less deferential to judges and the likes of those creeps. I really do. But it's just in me. And I'm, you know, and luckily in the proceedings we were in, I had Gemma on my side to give me a prod and say, you know, go for him. Yeah. I have a similar curse. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah, it's a, it is a curse. It is a curse. Well, it's something we need. It's a bit late for me, but we do need to work on it. This is, we're not, you know, this is not a, this is not a dinner party. We're in a war. This is a war. Yeah. So, um, yeah. yeah, what is, yeah, the, the, this court case tomorrow, this, okay, I'm going to put a question up, um, but you don't have to answer. I don't know what's appropriate to answer, but that's the question that he wants to ask. I I I I can't go because I have a meeting with my lawyers tomorrow concerning a court case that's coming up for me in a couple of weeks, which you know is similar uh, to the things that Jim is facing, and uh, in some respects, and which you know is an attempt to basically wipe me out, to bankrupt me, and I have to be to deal with that. But uh, I have been speaking to Gemma today. Uh, I've been discussing with her what what her options are. Uh, she's very very determined, very clear. I mean, I she told me, and and I do welcome this. And having said all I said about the media, that she has been quite struck by the truthfulness of some of the reports of what happened in court the other day. She's encouraged by that because that's the first time that's happened now in all of the last four years. In, to either of us and that's encouraging that journalists are finally beginning to see that Gemma is not the problem that 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 the, the forces aligned against her are crooked and and that that's we need to shine the light on that crookedness not take their word for it that Gemma is the problem she's not the problem she's a f- fine journalist she's fearless and in this particular case, what she's saying is absolutely 100% true. But nobody would report that until yesterday, until today, I think, in the last 24 hours anyway. Decent reports have started to emerge from these proceedings for the very first time. Now, that's, that's, a, that's a novelty, and it's a very welcome one. So mm-hmm. let's see what break tomorrow brings. Yeah, yeah. Everybody should be keeping track of it. It's definitely it's a major incident. Yes, it is. It is. It, it, it goes to the fundamentals of our freedom. If journalists can be jailed for writing about things in the public interest and telling the truth about them to the best of their ability on a, on a rolling basis to discover the truth, then that's the end of our capacity to protect ourselves and our freedoms. I'm muted. Yeah. Yeah, indeed. All right. Um, I'm sort of a. I'm aware. I don't want to ask too many questions about it. Um, so I'm going to move back on to back onto your election uh, at this point. Is that if that's okay? Yeah. Because um, I know your time's limited, and I'm afraid I'll I'll start probing. So um, all right. This question. This guy now wrote. A, he he wrote quite a long comment, which has kind of got a number of questions in it, and they're above my pay grade to answer <laughs> for sure. So. Um, I'll start it off. Does the rejection of the two recent referendums make it self-evident that the automatic transcription of EU directives into our statute books is and always was ultra vires? Are the accompanying fines that the EU imposes for not implementing directives, etc., ultra vires? Well, you see, I see these as political questions, really. 
uh, as opposed to be legal to, to legal ones. Uh, ultimately, our membership of the EU and our determination thereof is a political question. In other words, we can decide. We, the Irish people, can decide what we want to do with our country. You know, and 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 we don't have to go to an European court for permission to leave the European Union. We can simply tell them, well, we've had enough now, and we're we're, we're out of here. And 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 you know, we we have to obviously deal with that in in certain ways in order to protect ourselves in the in in the immediate aftermath and so on. But these are again political questions. They're about alliances and and uh, packs and so on, with friendly packs with other countries and capacity to to uh, you know exchange means and 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 uh, resources and so on. And uh, but the the problem is that these techniques have been used as if to, to imply that you know we signed away our our freedom absolutely and eternally. No, 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 no government has the right to do that. No people have the right to do that. We can't. We cannot sign our children into slavery. It's not. It's not possible. It's not morally pos- comprehensible. It's, it, you know. So, uh, I just think you know. It's 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 like so many things that you hear about. You know that, if, for example, even say like this pandemic treaty. I mean, the one of the reasons I don't panic about it is for this reason precisely that you know when we get a, that decent government of Irish people of character and. And, and intelligence and, and decency, um, they can just draw a pin to it. Say we're not we're not doing that anymore. Sorry, and just don't answer the phone to to that. What do you call that guy in the who, uh, or the other Irish guy in the who, uh, who's a, oh, yeah. even a worse creep, I'd say, if that's possible, which it isn't. So no, we don't have to answer the phone to those guys. And I mean, in the same way, you know, like you see the, this kind of thing, people say sometimes, well. You know, oh, they had to do it because they were told by by the who? What? 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 Like, what are you talking about? Just say no. No, we're not doing it. Well, mm. Why not? We just don't want to do it. I, you know, we're a sovereign country. We're not doing it. And and that that's got to be the, the the way it goes. And then we just everybody and it'd be amazed actually. If one country did that, everybody else might do it. And and then we would you know get all our countries back and restore then you know, free trade between all the different countries and we would be good at make, growing organic vegetables and they would be good at, you know, making computers and we'd swap some carrots for a, for a laptop. That's that's kind of crudely the, the, the way they used to be and it was fine until these totalitarians took over and they had an entirely different agenda while pretending that they were interested in free trade and so on. They're not interested in free trade. They're interested in bringing in a, a control grid, digital control grid that will reduce us all to basically chickens in in a in a in a, in a factory running around. Is it the little. case that we could? Sorry, is it the case that we could legitimately invoke emergency powers to uh, counter the European Trade Union of politicians and bureaucrats? Um, well, we can do what we like, really, as a people. Uh, once we we you know recognize. The body of people that is the, the the sovereign people, and we can decide anything we like. We could we could re- reinvent our constitution. At the moment, our constitution, uh, which is a big bugbear in relation to the constitutional action we took, and and again, it was this issue they, they had no answer to, and they didn't answer it uh, really in any satisfactory way. They ignored the question by now. But the Irish constitution, as it stands, allows for the declaration of an emergency in only two circumstances, which really amount to one. The two are war. And armed rebellion, and they're they're essentially the same thing, or you know they, they're similar. Now, the the really important point here is that uh, th- that that article was redrafted uh, in 1939 to deal with the emergency that was perceived to be coming, which is what we now know as World War Two. Although uh, I think in Irish parlance it's still called the emergency, and. That the, the the there was a discussion then at that point as to whether the constitution that in the, in in revoking because the, the the point that had to be addressed in that refer in that um, process it wasn't a referendum because the constitution was still being bedded down and it could be amended in for the first I think for three or four years it could be amended amended by the Iraqis uh, so th- so the the issue, the issue to be addressed then was that this particular war that was coming 
because it didn't involve Ireland as a participant, didn't really qu qualify for the wording as it then was. And it was felt that that needed to be uh, tweaked a little bit. And that thing was was discussed. And then at the same time, there was a much bigger discussion, which was as to whether, now that we were doing this, should we not include other forms of emergency? Pandemics, cata mm. natural catastrophes, etc. And the verdict was no. It's too dangerous. It's too it's too to give this devil errors to give this instrument to a future government uh, would be a, a recipe for tyranny. Mm. Well, so turns out, well, yeah. <laughs> so that's what happened in 2020. And this was the interesting thing in our at the core of our papers that that nobody wanted to talk about. That's why they they wouldn't cover what we were doing. So. So the answer to your question, I mean, I, I am a great believer that sovereignty means sovereignty, you know, and that the people, that's why we have a parliament. That's why we have the Oireachtas. That's why we have, you know, uh, the Supreme Court. We, you know, that's why we have all these things, so that we can actually govern ourselves and that we can deal with any potential problem. That's, that's a, there's no point in having guys being paid the same money for being messenger boys as if they were actual leaders. Because that's what we do. Like, you wouldn't send Simon Harris to the shops to buy you a pound of butter because he, he, no. he wouldn't know what to come back with. Like, and and I, I'm not saying that that's not to disparage him. It's just true. You just look at him. You just listen to him for two minutes and you know it. So how did that happen, like, that we got that quality of individual T-shirt? Come on, like what? I, I look out my window when I, today, I, when, whenever the day he was appointed, you know, I think I, I expect people to be retching into the to the gutter, you know, with disgust at this this appalling travesty and this this humiliation that has befallen the Irish people, that their their chieftain, the, the chieftainship of the Irish people has been taken over by this absolute moron, and and uh, they're not, and I say why. Why not? Are you not disgusted? So, like that's that's all part of the same process. The process that started in 1972 with a referendum where we voted away our sovereignty to the European Union, and then in nine, there were other there were other staging posts, but the other critical one was in 2011 when when we allowed we essentially, as I say, a self coup on autocolpe, which essentially was set was set itself the objective of ensuring that in the future. The, the government, Irish government, will become permanent; that it, it could never be removed, and that's kind of look what's happened. Like you know, I've I've gone through this, but it's 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 interesting to go through it again. Like that in two thousand and eleven, uh, there was this moment when there, any movement could have taken over, but democracy now blocked up the hallway and didn't allow it to happen, and then they disappeared and left Inda Kenny and I mean, Gilmore to go in. Okay, so they had an overall majority, but then in twenty sixteen they were kicked out. People kicked him out. What happened? Fianna Fáil, the deadly enemy of Fine Gael, came in and offered him a, a confidence and supply arrangement, whatever this is, confidence and what supply of what, nobody knew. Uh, but they just propped him up for the next few years. Then another election came, then Vradker came in, guy who got elected on the fifth count, got it, came in, and uh, he came to Taoiseach. And then he went on to 2020, and then he was voted out again by the people. Get lost. But then there was this hiatus waiting for the pandemic. And mm. in the most traumatic and the most extraordinary period in, in Irish history, this guy, who had been voted out of office, took charge and implemented the most anti-democratic set of laws ever introduced in Ireland by anybody, including Cromwell. Right? Now, uh, uh, like, here we are now in 2024 20, and he's handed over to a guy who got elected on the 15th count so like if this not if this isn't the end of democracy in ireland i don't know what it's supposed to be called there's a serious there's a serious problem clearly yeah i mean we're just we're just moving further and further away from democracy and the only place you go at the end of that is totalitarianism and and then we're at least halfway at least halfway and 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 uh, and nobody seems to notice because they'll talk about Harris in, as though he were some kind, you know, just, well, he's the latest uh, Taoiseach and interesting, mm -hmm. youngest Taoiseach, yeah, oh, yeah. And we wanted to hear what his parents have to say about him. And uh, 
I don't care. Get them out of there. <laughs> yeah. Being the youngest isn't in itself a good thing, right? No, it's not. It's not at all. And and uh, it's not necessarily a bad thing. It's not necessarily you, I could imagine. Look at the look at the founders, the founding fathers of America. They were all youngsters, like, you know, great men though. Mm. They weren't like Simon Harris. You know, look at the 1916 leaders, apart from I think Clark, like they were all young fellas, really. It's not necessarily uh, a bad thing, but but if you yeah. had to guess, <laughs> more more likely than not. Well, you want you want the more mature the better, right? Well, actually, the, 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 perhaps there is some cultural thing in, in, in to do with the, the times, with the decades moving forward. That that in which it is a bad thing because there's a kind of a process of infantilization going on through popular culture and bad education and all that kind of stuff. That actually means that people of thirty in their thirties are not mature enough to to do this kind of stuff anymore. Whereas Back then, guys in their 20s were eminently qualified, and that's got to be an educational issue more than anything in the broadest sense. Uh, so, yeah, you're, you're dealing with these guys like, you know, who like, you, you run out of words trying to describe their, their, their unsuitability, to put it very, very politely, uh, for, for these jobs. Um, they, they, they shouldn't be that near the place, you know? I mean, the, the junior clerks, maybe. In, in the, the, the teacher office. That's about as far as I'd go with either of those two last incumbents of the office. Mm. Yeah. All right. Um, so those two questions came from a longer a longer statement. Now, this guy, um, I don't want to call him a legal nerd, but I think maybe he's a bit of a legal nerd. So I'm going to read out the rest of his, uh, of, of his comment because it is good and I know people will appreciate it. And then you can comment on it afterwards. Okay. Okay. So he says, the Irish state is the metaphysical political representation of the Irish nation with the physical public with the physical public sector to implement the will of the Irish nation through the Irish state. The EU has members has member states, not nations, and our government is occupied by the EU's member state in Ireland. How is it constitutional legal under Boonrock Article 9.3 for a bunch of people to continue to occupy the Irish state when their fidelity is for their EU colony? And they're so clearly loyal to their EU imperial state. How is it constitutional, legal, treason act, Article 49 of the Fourth Geneva Convention for the EU, including Irish politicians and bureaucrats, to grant supremacy under the guise of equality and the transfer of sovereignty to the EU through the colony it has established in our territory? Are the priorities of the EU as described in documents like EDMO Ireland Hub Briefing Report, January 2023, ultra vires? You see, yeah, it's all very solid. Um, the, the problem is, though, that something had very disturbing has happened to our judicial system. You know, if you look back at the judgments of the 1960s, and, you know, these were in general, like, eminent, Brian Walsh, people like that, you know, um, even people like Seamus Henshi more recently. Uh, there were exemplary judgments of, you know, based on reason, logic, uh, truth, um, but something strange has happened to to the culture, which seems to be in a, almost a reversal of the processes of jurisprudence. In the sense that they kind of look, it's almost like you know when you were in school doing like say a mental arithmetic problem or an algebraic problem, and the answers were at the end of the book, and you, you what you would do is you go to the, look at the end if you couldn't figure out the problem or if you had missed that particular module you just look at the answer and you then you try to construct your your, your reverse engineer your um your, your problem solving effort to suit to get to the figure to the to the answer uh without necessarily understanding why you were doing what you were doing or in following any particular path of logic that's kind of what's happened to the to, to the courts now that the exigencies of, uh, of, you see, first of all, you have to start with the idea that what's happened is that the political system and the political, the, its denizens, the people who are operated, are not up to running the country, uh, you know, as a country, as an independent country. They, they need these outside forces. They need to, to, to prop them up. And then they're, they're kind of, they get used to that and they're happy to just carry out instructions as opposed to actually having to go through the slog of solving problems and creating opportunities in their own country. They, they don't know how to do that anymore. And it's it's almost un, unimaginable to them. And so the judiciary kind of fall in with this kind of stuff whereby they then say, well, okay, well now we have to construct it so that we, 
we need to belong to all these external agencies and we need to do what they tell us. So therefore, we have all the, and now we have this problem of our constitution and this kind of you know precedent and case law. We need to tweak that. When you look at a lot of judgments now and, and that come out of the courts, you see that process of literally looking for the answer at the end of the book, where they're constructing a logic which, or a quasi-logic to, to actually reach that point. And that's kind of what's going on. So there's in a certain sense, it's impossible to test those propositions that you're, 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 the guy there sets out because they're in a certain sense irrefutable. But the, 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 the judges don't feel bound by them anymore because the, the, the exigencies of running the country in the only way that the political establishment is able to run it require the flexibility of being basically to give to the supranational organizations, particularly the EU and but also the UN, the World Economic Forum now is a big bugbear. I mean, that's a deeply sinister organization. And, and we're now doing all this stuff. Uh, and you see it. I mean, it's quite extraordinary to see that reverse engineering process happening and doing it with completely barefaced, you know, I mean, contradicting one judgment, you know, the last judgment with the current one, you know. I, I give an example. I mean, when we went to uh, with our uh, case, one of the things we were actually talking about was the, the language of the Constitution, and, and, and it's literally in the, the Articles 40 to 44, which use these really strong words called inalienable, imprescriptible, indefeasible. You know, so these are absolute words like inalienable. You know, yeah. cannot be given up, cannot be taken away. You know, the, the, you know, it's untouchable, really. And and then, but you see, when you look at the lot of the judgments that have been handed down by courts in the last few years, particularly say, for example, in relation to abortion abortion or uh, the, the rights of the unborn related, you know, you see that they're constantly tweaking and trying to create logics that seem to, in a certain light, they're like, it's like a form of magic in, in, in words where they can undo something. And one of the things they did was they claimed to be able to uh, disallow the use of natural law within the constitution, as it were, to trump the will of the people. But I mean, that's not possible. Because the natural law does trump the will of the people, you know, laws that are natural are absolute. They're mm. they're not generated by human beings. They're not human in, in, generated by the people. They're not generated by politicians, by the rockers, by government, by anybody. They're they're given to us now. Whether or not you believe in in God or any God, is kind of beside the point. The point is that these are absolute. That otherwise there would be no law. That they're the foundation yeah. of all law. And they go back to the Greeks, like they're not like recent inventions, as people try and tell you that they're Catholic laws. They're not. Uh, so you know, do you see all this? Like there was one of the ones, the most startling ones that I saw was this in relation to this language, because when we in, in myself and Gemma in our case raised the kind of absolute nature of this language, the judge just dismissed it out of hand. All oh, those words, are, they, they, they don't not to be taken literally, you know, uh, they don't mean what they seem to say, you know. And then six months later, there was this extraordinary case. It was a case called Gari, in which the Supreme Court de deliberated upon it, the, the different issues. It was an immigration case. So it was foreigners who were involved. Mm. And here, the Supreme Court judges, there's two of them, issued lengthy deliberations and meditations upon the absolute or quasi-absolute nature of the language. And they did set out several reasons why these words had to be taken absolutely at face value, including the, rep the, the numbers of times that they were repeated, the emphasis, that this couldn't be seen as an accidental thing, uh, you know, a, a random sort of quirk of the, the framers' phraseology, that this was actually an indicative of their intention that these words would be seen as absolute. Now, when you stand back from that, you have to conclude. No, I don't see how it is possible from those two examples to conclude anything other than the following. That where indigenous, indigenous peoples, natives are concerned, the courts are quite happy to tell people, no, no, it's not to be taken literally. It's all old nonsense. Don't mind that. You know, you know, you have no rights. Shut up. But when a foreigner comes in and invokes the same language, he or she is told, yes, there, it says it, it does exactly what it says on the 10. Now, that kind of gives you a sense of why 
you know, in a sense, I whereas I, I, I hear all these arguments all the time, but there's no point in making them. There's no point in saying this is what it should follow. This is just what should follow. My question, what court are you going to go with that proposition? Because I need to know the answer to that because I'm going to have to tell you probably that you're wasting your time unless we change all this, unless we reverse all this and restore the sanctity of the Constitution and its language to the centre of our civilization, uh, which can be done. It can be done. You just need the will and the people to do it and get rid of these guys, all of them, right across the board. You know, get, find them something else to do that won't be causing trouble, that won't be destroying our country. Yeah, keep them busy. Yeah. Yeah. We can set, um, yeah, we set up an inquiry into themselves, maybe, and appoint them all to investigate each other or something. Yeah. Um, a man with perspective just bought the Baron some whiskey. Um, this is my new my new uh my new super chat system. I didn't know if it worked or not, but it did. And uh, he said the Baron is way too sober for the love of God. Buy the man some whiskey. <laughs> but um thank you very much, a man with perspective. So yeah, um now there's only one more question left on my list. And then I really want to just kind of, there was a few people asking, can I vote for him if I'm in South Mayo? And can I vote, you know, so we should go over what, how large this constituency you're running oh, is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But before I do, the um, the final question on my list was from a guy who said, "I would it would be great to bring up the tap water issue and how we are being poisoned with chlorine, etc. I have a belief that if there was a big push to raise the quality of the tap water in Ireland, then all the issues would start resolving. Yeah. Uh, certainly, it should be investigated. I, I don't. You see, I, I again, I'm not an expert on that. I kind of would semi jocosely ask. Well, I I drink a lot of water, like, but it doesn't seem to affect me. So I, I'm not sure, you know, what that means. Uh, I don't. I'm not using that in a frivolous way or a glib way. I mean, I, I think there could well be a problem there. I certainly don't see why a water has to be contaminated in this way. Uh, and you know that's one of the issues I think that again it's that's something that's untouchable within the current it seems within the current dispensation and why 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 should it be why why can't the teacher simply say well that's an interesting question I'm going to I'm going to set up a, a, a panel to investigate that and they will report by 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 late summer you know I don't see why and then we'll work we'll act on that that's what government is for but you see, this, when you have all these other forces at play, then, then these things don't get looked at. So, I mean, we know, we need to purge all of this stuff from our from our country. Now, you see, one, just to touch on this point, which is it's kind of it's kind of extending a point I made earlier about the the idea of just saying no. Uh, like it, it's sometimes said to me, uh, well, you know, that you look at all what happened, to all those um, African leaders who. who, who uh, uh, quibbled with the the COVID stuff, and they, they several of them ended up dead, and they did. Uh, I don't know. Um, you see, that's kind of goes with the territory. It seems to me, if you're going to be elected teacher, and somebody comes into your office and tries to make you do something undemocratic or something against the interests of your people, you just do what Charlie Hall used to do: point to the window, say, "Jump out the window." Uh, you know that's that's what you do, and yeah. if they shoot you, if they kill you, then they kill you. But make sure that you leave behind the record of who's came to you and who what happened, so that this can be eliminated, and that we actually we're not any longer living in fear at any level in our country, for f that we have to give our country away in order not to be killed by these bastards. I really think that's kind of important, and and uh, so. All that, so we we just say no. I mean, I mean that should maybe my be my my slogan um, for the election. Just say no, uh, because we did say no in in on March eighth, and that was wonderful. But we're going to have to say it in lots of other ways as as the future unfolds, because otherwise there won't be much of a future. And and uh, so that's kind of I suppose ultimately my manifesto. Yeah, a lot of people are pointing out. Yeah, there's fluoride and everything. Um. That chlorine isn't the biggest problem. I would recommend to everybody to get on to get a reverse osmosis system if you can afford it. Um, the, if for no other reason than the water tastes significantly better, but mm. um, yeah, yeah, you don't want to be drinking all the stuff that could be in your water, especially if you're in 
one of these areas where the water isn't even as optimal as you might say it would be in a in in, in more built up areas where they claim it's clean but yeah yeah and but i don't know that bottled water is really any better you know uh, from what i've seen some of the research i've seen it's just as bad or worse you know so yeah yeah reverse osmosis systems seem to be the way to go um so now somebody else said something um yeah i just wanted to say that vote for john the irish freedom party any sorry vote for john an irish freedom party candidate and maybe one or two others but not any of the current government parties not Sinn fein and not people before profit i feel like it goes without saying with people for profit <laughs> don't vote for them yeah whatever. Like, like that's crazy um, yeah no, no, absolutely not. Don't be taken in by by any notion that they're oppositional. They're not. They're the the tack dogs for the establishment. Yeah, yeah. That's just like if you want to throw away the country, that's that's one way to do it. If you think they're going to make your life better, um, that's a terrible yeah. mistake you're making. That's a terrible error. Um, okay, John. So let's just talk about where people can vote for you. Where this is a very large constituency. Very large. Um. Yeah. um well, okay. It it it. It, I'll, I'll, I'll say it, it goes from, say, Malinhead, the very tip of Donegal, the very crown of Donegal, uh, goes right down to Sligo, over and across down the west coast, Mayo, Galway. Uh, it, so it goes down as far as Galway. Uh, Clare is not. Clare is, is in Limerick area in, in the Munster constituency. But then it goes right across the Midlands and it scoops up Longford, Offaly, Leash, uh, Goes on to Kildare and Loud, up to Cavan Monaghan, back into um, uh, towards into uh, Leitrim, Roscommon. Uh, I think that's about it. Uh, so this it's like it's probably close to being two thirds of the republic of the geography of the republic, uh, mm -hmm. although not the population, obviously. Uh, it's probably the more sparsely, uh, uh, you know, then the Leinster, the Munster uh, uh, constituency is quite large too, but it's nothing like as large as, as this one, which is called Midlands Northwest. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's it's kind of as a political entity, it's kind of like, you know, it, it sort of resists the, the, the concept of, you know, uh, personal canvassing, you know, because uh, it would take you about two years to go around the whole lot of it uh, in any meaningful way. Um, but uh, I mean, that's why I say, you know, I think I can do a lot of communication with people via the alternative channels and uh, like your one. And, and uh, that's kind of what I'm at the moment doing. I mean, that may change as the campaign goes on. But you got to remember as well that doing personal events and so on is not what is not, you know, as straightforward as it used to be. I mean, obviously, in a free country you could uh, have a political meeting anywhere at one time and, and invite people to go and, and advertise it and speak and be left alone. And maybe people would heckle you or disagree with you, but they wouldn't use force and, and, and obscenities and so on to, to try to stop you and, and uh, threats and menaces. Uh, but this is what happens now, you know, if you if you are in any way critical of the government. And, you know, don't try to tell me this isn't the government doing this. You know, it's just because these are complete sleazebags doing it. It doesn't mean that the government aren't paying them uh, because they are. The government is paying them. And uh, so, I mean, the problem with that is not that, you know, one is particularly scared of them, but, that you know, they, they do try to set up situations where it's to, so as to frame people. You know, this is standard. I mean, you saw what happened there last week in, in Kulak. Where you have sleazebag journalists like you know working alongside Antifa, uh, supposedly doing an uh, undercover investigation. Well, why wouldn't somebody do an intern uh, an undercover investigation into Antifa and sleazebag journalists? That would be a worthwhile exercise, uh, you know, rather than yeah. investigating the decent people of Kulak who are simply trying to defend their community from scum. Like, you know, so this is what we're up against. But, you know, so I, I mean, I'd love to be able to go around and do large meetings and, you know, speak in t the towns that I know so well and, and all over the constituency, you know. Uh, but I don't know if that's going to be possible. But if it is, we will try and do it. Uh, you know, uh, you know, there, there was a time when you could actually do it and, and the guards would, would ensure uh, that security, you wouldn't have to. Uh, think about this matter. You know, the guards would just simply anybody started causing trouble, they just put them in the black Mariah and take them away. But that the guards are now you need black Mariahs to take away the guards now. You see, it's a <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah, this is what we're up against, you know. So uh, 
but anyway, I mean, it's in, these are unusual circumstances. I hope people can understand uh, that you know I'm trying to communicate with them as best you know to the, with using the tools available. I hope I have the reach with that. Uh, I think I might have. I think it, certainly enough to cross the line, and uh, you know that's that's all I can do. Yeah, so I've seen one guy say, "Oh, wow, well, you're uh, you're in my constituency, so I, I can vote for you." And I saw another guy asking earlier, um, "I'm in South Mayo, can I vote for you?" So it seems like at least two people didn't know they could vote for you that were watching it now. Oh yeah. Too. So oh, yeah. as a I'd all of Mayo, see... all of Galway, all of the counties, all those counties I mentioned, I'll say them again: Donegal, Sligo, Mayo, Leitrim, Mayo, Roscommon, Galway, Longford, Offaly, Leash. Kildare, Loud, Cavan, Monaghan. I think that's 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 got that's what's covered it. Hmm. Yeah. So like, um, you know, people were asking, should 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 you go on the mainstream media? I think as an it'd be an interesting uh, experiment to do. Anybody listening to this stream now who has maybe decided to vote for uh, to vote for John because of it, and other streams like Niles and um, you were on James's as well, weren't you? And yeah, uh, and, and a number of other streams. You should go over, and if you were convinced by that stream, you should comment and say that the stream convinced you, and let's show that it has this effect. I think you can probably hear my son crying outside the door. <laughs> but um, yeah, like people need to realize that this does. This is a this is a valid way of getting the word out there. Well, yes, it is, and 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 moreover, um, it's essential that we continue to build it. This is as important. Building this me alternative media is just as important as taking seats in political in parliaments. You know, it's just as important because you can't have a free society without a free without a free media, and we don't have one. We have a bought and paid for media in the mainstream. It's and that's worse than just simply an, a lack. It's not a lack. That's something alien. That's a lie where the truth should be, or a hundred million lies where the truth, hundred million truths should be. You know, and and that's that's what's so insidious about that. You know that. It's not just that they're telling lies, but that they're telling lies while pretending to be telling the truth. That's deadly, deadly. Um, all right, so on that note, on supporting the alternative media, Declan gifted five Baron Strawberry memberships. Thank you very much, Declan. And Mr. Twisted Frenzy wants to ask you a question. Okay. For five euro, he said, what do you make of Aintu? Are they good to vote for or are they controlled opposition? Um, I, I don't I don't buy the idea of control. I, I, I need a lot of convincing that anybody is a controlled opposition. I, I, I don't think it, I don't know that you know I know the concept and so on. I don't think they are. Uh, I you know I think they have a lot of good people and a lot of good qualities. Uh, I, I, I have some reservations because of their connection past connection with Sinn Fein. Um, you know that that's you see I, I I worry about Sinn Fein on all kinds of levels, not just the ones I mentioned, but the fact that you know they have such a recent um, history of uh, connection to violence and so on. You know, and, and given that the license that that uh, the the present the mainstream parties, the the, the big beasts, Fianna Fáil and Fine Gael, in office in in power in the last few years have been able to to harvest all of this totalitarian, these absolute powers. That's a very dangerous package to hand into the uh, to people in, in Sinn Fein, and you know I'm not, you know I'm, I don't see evidence that into are in any way associated with that, but it would worry me to some extent. I, I you know, I I think they're good people, uh, and I think they've done some good work in recent times on the referendums and so on. Um, they, I don't they're making they're making some headway now on other issues as well, such as immigration, and that's good. Um, but they were slow to come to the, to those to those questions. I think uh, that doesn't matter. I mean, it's fine. They're they're there now. So you know, I, I my own view is that insofar as there are political the, the part the political establishment, they're probably as good as it's, it's in there. But you see, my problem is that that you know, for the last few years, you know, the political establishment, all of the parties virtually, were working in the same direction. You know, they were they were like. There was no real demoral from within the system about what was being done, and they too weren't. I mean, they were basically ferrying people to vaccination centres, like which is something that cannot be overlooked. And uh, so, you know, I have mixed feelings about them. Um, I won't be voting for them, um, but 
-hmm. you know, I, I, people who have good good faith and, and so on think that they're worthy to voting for. I, I'm not going to start disagreeing with you. Uh, you know, they're not the worst. I'll certainly say that. And uh, but but perhaps we need to look beyond that, I would say, to genuine independent uh, movements that are emerging now if we can identify them because you know one of the problems with all of this is that once you go into the system there's always that danger of, of co-opting and contamination and you see it all the time there's the compromise enters in you know whether it's that knock on the door that happens or whatever it is you know that you, suddenly you begin to see your interests in a different way and and uh, that's something i hope i certainly don't intend it to happen to me uh but, uh, you know, I'm too old for it to happen to me, I think, anyway. I don't care. I, I, I'm not building a career at this point in my life. Uh, I'm, you know, I'm going to do five years of, of, of trying to, to uh, rattle as many cages as I can and, and, and influence and, and, and inspire, hopefully, uh, enough people that I won't need to do it for very much longer, that there will be other people, younger people, willing to take up the cudgels and, and fight against this tyranny and these tyrants. Uh, so, you know, I'm, 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 that's, that's my uh, position. But So I, I, I would, yeah, yeah if, if, if people, I mean, people, into have been very good on, on the, the pro-life issue, uh, as it's called, abortion, fighting abortion. There's no question about that. I can't, we can't gainsay that. And that's a very worthy thing. It's a very important thing. And uh, they do it very well. So, you know, on that basis, if people feel strongly about supporting them, I wouldn't, I wouldn't argue with them. Brilliant. Um, Logan Daly, big supporter of the channel, says he's an Irish American uh, Christian. He says, Godspeed, John, kick some bud and take some names in that hellhole we call the EU. Um, yeah <laughs> ronan uh ronan mccaughey says um who does john advise we give our second third and fourth votes to after giving him our number one vote oh well uh good question uh might be a bit early yet to, to answer it in very explicit terms um because we, we haven't seen all the runners yet um uh i, I would you know, I, I haven't announced it yet, but there will be one or two people maybe running alongside me in, in a certain, you know, in, in different parts of the constituencies in order to to pull in uh, some of the vote that, that necessarily wouldn't be naturally mine because it's so distant from my, my own heartland. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I, I haven't really, we haven't really firmed anything up on that yet. Um, but... There is a danger. I mean, I, I would absolutely urge people like, you know, with the caveat, which you've already entered into about into like that the mainstream parties, you know, really should not receive any votes at all, even down the pay, down the paper. You know, the people need to understand that, that sometimes, you know, in, in proportional representation, you'd be surprised who ends up with your vote. You know, it's not, you know, every 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 number every preference should be thought about because and 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 you know you can vote against people it's okay to vote against people by not voting for them and that yeah. is a way of not voting of, of voting against them so i mean i would be saying vote me number one and then say in in vote number two for jerry waters if he runs which i think he will uh kevin sharkey I, you know i would certainly be telling people that the ifp after that and uh, you know, other parties, national party. I, you know, that I would see that that they're the they're the people that need to be supported, and uh, so that, you know, even if those of us who get the first preferences go out, that the vote will continue to live and will become useful down the way to to, to some other person or party that is like minded and and has the same more or less. Uh, aspirations for Ireland and and for its its people, so yeah, I I, I that's kind of roughly. But I, as I say, I'll be can be more explicit. I'd say in a month or so or three weeks or so about that because uh, it's not clear. I don't know when the deadline for nominations is. I think it's sometime around the end of April or the early May, and so after that, it'll be much clearer and we can be very explicit about who we're recommending and so on. Brilliant. Um, all right, John. Well, I think that's everything. Um, it's been great having you on again, obviously. And clearly, um, my platform, such as it is, is open to you if you need it in the upcoming months. And 
and um, you know just contact me if there's something you want to get across to people or anything like that thanks so um, much Thank you. and thanks everybody for their uh, support and so on encouragement it's been very very good i mean we they did i don't know if people are aware they the uh, ball sport had me uh, started me off on last thursday at 33 to 1 and i think i ended up at um nine to nine to four which is pretty good within three days so now they've stopped taking bets because i don't know what to make of this you know I yeah i wish i had got it in at the at the big odds i was furious i saw i saw collins put it up on his telegram and i was like oh, i missed it <laughs> But yeah, it's, uh... Uh, it's, it's interesting because, uh, you know, I don't really understand the science of betting in this way, but it's it's really the punters who who kind of decide by the kind of money they're prepared to put on. I think at one point I went to two to one, but the kind of money dried up then. Well, I, I can understand that if you, you know, if you could get 33 to one yesterday and now it's two to one, like it's a bit sore, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, but it's it's it's, an, it's just an indicator of something that there's a bit of movement there. There's a there's a little energy uh, manifesting, and I hope to kind of to 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 make that grow now in the next eight weeks, I guess it is roughly. Uh, so there's quite a lot of time, a lot a long time to go yet. So I don't want to, uh, you know, burn out too soon. You know. Uh, I think we'll keep our best wine till last. Brilliant. Um, okay, so Declan for the just for the the five uh, Baron Strawberry memberships that he's given. I think all the longtime members are going to agree that Declan's going to need his own emoji. Uh, so I'm going to have to work on that over the next while. Um, Crispy, Doctor Crispy says we need to raid Nal McConnell. McConnell, he must be live at the moment. Now I haven't figured out how to do the actual proper raid yet. Um, I know that's somewhere in the settings. I could go look it up. But guys, if you're watching, head on over to Noel McConnell now as soon as this uh, stream ends, which is in the next 30 seconds or so. Head over to Noel McConnell. Uh, Crispy, maybe you could put a link in the chat for everyone to click on on the way out. And uh, then hopefully, hopefully we can get the bulk of the 330 people who are watching right now to jump into his chat and to drop some strawberries in there and, uh, you know, bolster his numbers. That's a great channel. It's well worth watching. All right, John, thank you very much for your time. Crispy's going to drop that link and I'm going to click end stream <laughs> and uh, and uh, I'll leave it at that. Great. Thanks very much, Shane. See you soon, I hope. All right, guys. Watch out for the link from Crispy. Bye-bye.